Historically, the relationship between Islam and the West has been a relationship where the West was in the West and Islam was in the Middle East and in the East. And what the West wanted in the 20th century was in the soil and in the seas of the East and they needed enough stability, they needed enough order, they needed enough policing in order to supply their industries with what the world of Islam had. I think they're paying the price for that investment in the securitization in order to extract, amongst others, the oil. And that has resulted in people beginning to find conditions where they can't live anymore and conflicts that they can't coexist with anymore and therefore today the encounter between Islam and the West is in the West. Every Western country has a minority of at least 10 percent and 25 of the global Muslim community now live under conditions of minority. Particularly over the last 50 years of migration from the Muslim world to the West is the recipe for Islamophobia. Muslims, their hijab, their sharia, their ways and their culture and their religion can be tolerated when it is out there in the Middle East and in the East. But when it comes into the heartlands of the West, the hijab, the sharia, the piety of Muslims is no longer easily tolerated. And this is the combustion that we are experiencing through Islamophobia, amongst others. There is so much um, of mobility in the world. Capital and goods move very fast at the push of a button. But when people move, then suddenly the world creates isms and phobias to deal with the foreigners and they have xenophobia, to deal with the blacks who come there and they have racism, and to deal with the Muslims who come there and they have Islamophobia. And so this double-edged sword of globalization marginalizes between countries, north and south, east and west, and marginalizes within countries your non-white and your white communities in the West. And so, out of this is the very contradictions of globalization. And out of this is created the many crises, the economic crises, because you've got so much wealth, but so much inequality. What you need is global governance. Governance that can make decisions for the whole of humanity and in the interest of the global community. And so the first thing that must change is the system of governance so that the United Nations no longer has a few countries have a veto. That's where the problem comes in. It can no longer have a situation where its Security Council excludes the entire Africa or even the Middle East. It cannot have that. And so there must be a reform of the United Nations, particularly its Security Council. There must be a reform of the Bretton Woods institutions, the World Bank and the IMF, so that the money follows the problem, not where the powerful want the money to go and on the conditions under which the powerful want to invest that money. So there must be the architecture at the top must change. And while we wait for that change, we must agitate for that change from the bottom. So I'm not saying top down or bottom up. I'm saying a pincer movement from the top and from the bottom. And that is where even civil society and NGOs are getting it wrong.